Eric Robotathan, uh, Executive Director of the Program on the Legal Profession. Uh, and uh, we talk a lot at, at PLP about uh, the evolving, uh, globalizing legal profession uh, and how that relates to legal education and professional development. Uh, we haven't done a program in this area for a while, so we're very blessed to uh, uh, have with us today uh, Professor Rebecca Purdom from Vermont Law School, uh, who is uh, Dean of the Environmental Law uh, uh, section there at uh, the law school, but also um, chairs the National Working Group on Distance uh, Education, uh, Distance Learning in Legal Education, uh, and uh, uh, has done a great deal of thinking about this. She was a, a terrific participant in our uh, Future Ed series of conferences we did uh, uh, in uh, the last two years before this, um, really trying to think about innovation in legal education. And uh, so without further ado, I'll pass you over to Rebecca. All right, thanks, Eric. And how's the mic? Is that okay? Um, before I get started, I'm just curious who's in the room. I know you're all here for lunch, but um, on top of that, who, how many folks are, are 1Ls? A couple of 1Ls. How many 2Ls? I see 2Ls, 3Ls. Right there, LLMs. Faculty? A couple faculty. Hangers on? Okay, <laughs> great. And just, <laughs> just to get a sense. Um, Eric is very kind. I have been chairing the working group in distance learning and legal education. I'm one of those folks who taught in classrooms for 10, 15 years. I'm a rock star classroom teacher. I thought it was great. And someone said, you need to start thinking about distance learning. And I thought they were crazy. And then through a series of events, ended up backing into it. And it's been really interesting to come into the, legal, into the law schools and start thinking about what distance education looks like, not because of distance education, but because what technology is doing to the legal profession and trying to get these two ideas together in the same room and, and make sure they're talking to each other. To that end, you get two big ideas into one room in 20 minutes, give or take. I'm going to shoot at about 70,000 feet. You're going to see me make, be slightly glib on a couple of things. Please ask me about them. If you think I'm being too easy on a topic, um, I'd love to delve in deeper. But I wanted to at least give you kind of the arc of the conversation that seems to be going on in the legal profession right now. So here's a little mind map of where I'm going to go. There has been disruption. I'll talk about disruption. But generally speaking, it's tough out there in legal practice, in legal placement, and in legal education. And so I'm going to talk about kind of how it's gotten rough. Everybody thinks the way to fix that, of course, is to make education better. And I'll talk about some of the trends there. I'll spend a little bit more time there. And what that means for the new kinds of people who are going to get hired. 3L, this is about you. And what I'm really interested in is what that means for law. If we start changing how we train people, what does that actually mean for how law itself changes? On that side, here's a little mind map for where we're going to go. When we talk about new education, these new educational trends in law schools, we're going to talk about technology. We're going to talk about the millennials how they're using technology, but also just how they're different. I'm going to say they. I know a few of you might be in here. Um, and really advances in educational theory. Some of that work has been done here, which is telling us very different things than the legal theory, that, or excuse me, the educational theory we use to create law schools. When we talk about new lawyers, there's a really interesting question on what we're going to be as lawyers in 10 years, in five years. Are we going to be law-savvy people, or are we going to be tech-savvy people? And what do we need to be to be competitive? What do we need to be to really address the kinds of things that are happening in law at that time? Also, really, what are clients going to look like? And who are we in relationship to those clients? And then I want to spend a little time talking about what happens if we really re-engineer the way we think about how we teach law, the kinds of lawyers we are. What does that mean law becomes? Is it the same kind of law that we are being taught right now in school? Now, Disruption in education is not my topic. Um, somebody, somebody here already wrote the entire book on it. If anyone has seen this work, there's been quite a lot of work done by Mr. Christensen on the fact that new technology is showing up and changing education in a sentence. His thesis essentially is this. Innovation tends to happen in weird places. Industry leaders make, on kind of a linear path, make better typical things. And the industry leaders, make, they make a television set a better television set, a clearer television set a bigger television set. You make a car a faster car, a cooler car. My car now has heated seats and Bluetooth. It's really neat. Those folks kind of keep going down the same march um, and creating new products, sometimes with better bells and whistles that we even as consumers can take. And then somebody shows up with this game changer. 
It's not about taking the same product and improving it. It's about something comes into, into the industry that makes everything completely different. And those innovators often leap out ahead of the folks who have been in charge the whole time. Think Kodak. Kodak made better and better and better and better pictures. And then Instagram shows up and Kodak gets in trouble. Yeah, Christian, Mr. Christensen essentially says, look, it's happened in education. We got better and better at classroom teaching and then all of a sudden computers showed up and everything all went to heck in a handbasket. I don't want to rehearse his thought because really he has addressed what's happened in higher ed generally. What's interesting is we haven't talked about that in law schools. And so that's where I'm going today. So let's talk about briefly. I'm just going to skim through this because I think this audience knows it, but what's happened in legal practice? It hasn't been good since 2007. We've really seen um, law firms in generally and a lot of legal practice has been hit hard by the diminishing economy. We've seen some really, really large law firms completely buckle and go out of business. We've seen the nature of law practice change. Used to be, of course, that if you got hired into a big firm, frankly, you were kind of useless the first couple of years, right? The law firm would train you up. Two, three years in, you'd be ready to practice law. And those years in between you and me were getting trained up, the client was paying the law firm kind of for your work and training. Clients have started to say, we're not going to pay for that anymore. Partially because it can be done other places. It was at General Electric recently that outsourced 100% of its discovery review to India. You know, discovery review used to be those, those great first and second year law jobs. You'd sit in a windowless classroom, or a windowless office room, and you'd go through boxes and boxes and boxes and order lots of Chinese and get paid a decent amount of money. Now it's happening somewhere else. What's interesting, and I'm going to come back to this, is that this lower line is the growth in what's happened to lawyers. That's where JDs have gone. And since, you know, it's 1995, 1996 where it starts, we haven't had a lot of growth. It's not that there isn't legal work. That top line is actually legal services. The gap is being filled like, with folks like this. It's not that there's not legal work, but somehow lawyers aren't doing it. And the Washington Post came out at the beginning of this month with this article. Did everybody see this? Kind of spooky. And I actually brought the statistics that, were, that came in. But here's what the Bureau of Labor Statistics says. This is really her headline. Bureau of Labor Statistics says that between 2010 and 2020, next decade, there are going to be 73,600 new law jobs total for the decade. Guess how many people we graduated in the first two years of that decade in law schools? Hundred and thirty two thousand seven hundred and fifty seven lawyers. Almost double. In other words, every job that the Bureau of Labor Statistics said we'd have for the decade has been filled, and there's still about sixty thousand people out still looking for work. This is just the annual number. This is how many we're graduating every year. This is how many people are getting jobs, and this is how many extra people are sitting around making coffee and hoping to get jobs. Of course, what do we do? We blame Legal education, it's the law school's fault. They aren't educating the kind of people we want. It, we want. And so, of course, is law school a losing game? And it wasn't just anybody saying this. These stories started coming out last year. And again, you know, those are the big guys. It doesn't help when the ABA tells you don't go to law school. Not worth it. All of these stories were coming out. Look at the dates, January, January. ABA came out in, in February and said this. These were all coming out right about the time that everybody was getting their acceptances from law schools, deciding whether or not to go. It wasn't really helpful. This is the kind of thing that make law school administrators mildly queasy. And then we had law school transparency, this group of law students that went out and started suing law schools for lying about, they allege, lying about placement rates, saying you're not giving a very good education, you, you're committing fraud on law students by sucking them into law schools and not having enough jobs in the industry for them. Huge blame on law schools. And everybody said, okay, we've got to reform law schools. By the way, students listened. This is, the, this is the line of how many people are taking the LSAT, thinking about going to law school. And in fact, we just got the statistics in for the 2012. This steep decline is, is particularly scary. Um, from 2010 to 2011, we had a 16.9. We had a 17 point drop. And how many percent drop? And how many students were taking the LSAT in October? We just got 
last month's statistics, so from 2011 to 2012, we've had another 16.5% drop in the number of students who are taking the LSAT. This is at the same time that law schools have been expanding their classes, taking in more students. They're seeing that they're having this economic little hiccup. What's the way to deal with it? We'll bring in more students. We'll get more income. It'll all be OK. We have fewer students applying to law school right now than we did in 1999. Law, so there's about 30% more seats in law schools than there were in 1999. In fact, last year, and I think it was before the March LSAT was taken, we actually had fewer people who had taken the LSAT than there were seats in first year classes in law schools. So folks are saying, OK, law schools stink. You shouldn't go to law school. It doesn't make you a good lawyer. So everybody says, OK, let's reform legal education. How are we going to do that? Well, it's interesting because the things that are being suggested and the things that I, I'm going to suggest are happening are, are not coming together. New York Law School said, we've got it figured out. Third year of law school, no classes. It's going to be all experiential, and you're going to go overseas, and you're going to become a global lawyer, and you're going to meet everybody. A lot of other folks have said, all clinics, your third year, all semesters in practice, all you know, this, these clinical experiential simulations that will help you become more practiced. And I'll, I'll talk about the value of those in a minute. But they really have not, no one has said we're going to do anything different in those first two years. We're just, you know, you're going to take contracts your first year, and you're going to take torts, and you're going to sit in a big lecture hall, much larger than this, and someone's going to stand here, and they're going to Socratic methodize you. I'm watching the one else say, yeah, we've been there. And that's going to be it. I don't think that that's actually where, where, the, where the trends need to go. So here we go. Let's talk a little bit about what technology is doing. Let's talk about what technology did before. Does anybody recognize the photo? It's Langdell. Langdell shows up at Harvard in 1870, give or take, right? And says, OK, I've got a whole new method to teach law. I'm really going to teach folks the science of law. We're going, to, we're going to study it deeply. And the way we're going to do this is the case method. We're going to look at cases very carefully, and we're going to parse them about. And I'm going to teach you to be really good thinkers. This was a technological revolution. Let me know why. Let me know who this guy is. Two years later, he founds West Publishing. About 1870, we suddenly could all afford our own copies of books. Prior to really cheap printing, prior to Langdell, the faculty member would stand up here at the podium. They wouldn't ask you what you'd read in the case, because you probably couldn't afford your own book. Instead, he would read to you from the book, or at least tell you what all the books said. A learned person who was a professor was largely someone who had read a lot of books and could tell you about them. And you became learned yourself if you could actually get that same information into your noggin, either by reading a lot or by listening to people like that. And all of a sudden, everybody could have their own books. And so the professor standing there reading was pretty archaic. We need to find a new way to think about law. So this new wonderful technology suddenly comes into play. Everybody gets their own book, and now we're going to teach now that everybody has access to the information. In fact, everybody has access to lots of information. So now we need to teach them how to understand the information. How to, how to parse through it, how to think deeply about it. Sound familiar? Today, we're having the same kind of revolution. And it's coming in all sorts of different ways. But basically, we've got a new technology. We've got this computer. And suddenly, you don't have to talk to the person who knows how to teach you to read. You need to talk to the person who knows how to teach you to manage information. And we're seeing that come out in all sorts of, frankly, big, messy ways. Khan Academy. Folks familiar with Khan Academy? You know, you, lovely gentleman who sat in his closet doing math problems on a whiteboard for his cousins back at home overseas and found out that they actually learned better than if they read the stuff in a book or when they talked to him in person because they could repeat the videos over and over. Massive revolution in the way we use technology in teaching. Um, heard about these things, right? Massive open online courses. You get somebody brilliant standing in front and frankly just gets videotaped, but then it goes out to the world. The Stanford University course that was several million people, I think, over a couple hundred thousand at least overall. Coursera. Coursera, well, OK. edX, Coursera, you're getting different versions of this. But suddenly, we have this technology that is changing the way we teach, or at least what we can do with it. And making just as arcane, I'm going to argue, in some ways, this old idea of everybody gets their own book, they read their own book, and someone quizzes you on it, as it was to have someone lecture to you about books. Sloan C, I'm just going to mention, is the organization that's been studying this stuff. 
and really looking at how all of this different kind of technology, and they, they took a broad view, has really impacted education, particularly higher education, in the last 10 years. They started doing a survey with the Babson Group in about 2002. Last year, 6.1 million students took courses online at the college level. Last year, there was a 10.1% growth in distance learning in higher ed. That is the smallest growth since 2002, only 10%. Anyone want to take a guess at how much higher ed as an industry grew last year? Less than 1%. So online learning grew at least in a decade and was 10% over you know, a barely incremental change. There's these massive changes happening in higher ed. And it's really around this new way to access information and try to figure out how information works. Law schools haven't really got there yet. There's a few projects. There's some few interesting projects. The so folk at Michigan State are really looking at how technology impacts law and how technology impacts education around law. Law Without Walls, which I think there's some folks here at Harvard that work with the Law Without Walls program. Some folks out of Florida and I think Arizona are doing some really interesting things. Vermont Law School has a class in digital drafting, how to use the, the new tools for e-discovery or contract writing or anything else, how to use those new algorithms to actually get in there and do work. Oliver Goodniff is actually um, the gentleman who teaches that course and may be able to tell you a little bit more about it. I want to pause for a second to say there's two kinds of technology going on here who are I'm totally conflating, and I'm going to do it intentionally, but let me identify them for you. Technology number one is that technology that impacts how law is practiced e-discovery, um, new kinds of ways that algorithms are forming contracts. There's all that technology and law stuff. There's also technology and education stuff. It's distance learning. There's asynchronous and synchronous different methods. And most folks divide the two and say, oh, that's education and that's legal practice. I think that you'll see later those have completely converged. And, and to make a distinction is kind of silly, but I want you to recognize that there are at least those two buckets to talk about. These folks are really in the middle, where we're using Law Without Walls is using really sophisticated educational software to get lots of people together. And then they're doing interesting things. Digital drafting is actually a traditional classroom class, isn't it? They all sit in a room like this and learn how to use computers to do law. This stuff is all coming together. A lot of this work has actually been done at the Berkman Center, um, really thinking about how law and technology is, is going forward in the world. Um, and the Future Ed Series, which Eric mentioned, has really been a place where this conversation, I think, started for the first times on the educational side of law schools. It's the first time that this group got together, which Eric mentioned. It's remarkable to me that Sloan has been doing studies on higher ed in distance, excuse me, distance learning in higher ed since 2002, and the Legal Academy had not had a group to talk about this, other than one little group at the ABA, until this, oh, was it this time last year? Was our first meeting last October? November. Yeah, November. First time that law schools have actually gotten together as a collaborative unit to say we need to talk about distance learning in, in higher ed, in legal ed. We're that far behind. Now, why are we that far behind? Um, these guys. American Bar Association has very strict rules right now on distance learning, and it's just worth telling you what they are. You can't do anything your first year, period. Absolutely nothing in the first year curriculum. Then, in your second and third year curriculums, you may take four credits a semester and a total of 12 credits in your entire program. So unlike other schools that have been putting distance learning programs up online for, for degrees and for other credentials, law schools just haven't had any incentive at all to climb into this space. There have been a few law schools that have climbed in. LLMs have been here for a little while. Technically, those are not accredited by the ABA, but the ABA needs to bless them a little bit. The LLMs that started online, it's important for me to note, those are all tax LLMs. Every one of the ones that went up in the first decade were tax which basically means everyone I've seen, it's kind of interactive video. It's like interactive TV from the 80s. And frankly, tax attorneys were in a position to do that. Your boss will let you close your office door at 4 in the afternoon and take a seminar on the new regs and tax, because that benefits the firm, it benefits you, that's fine. But anything more sophisticated, like what other places in higher ed were doing, we really haven't seen happen at the legal level, except for a couple of little programs I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there, I should say there is a proposal that the working group actually helped put up to increase the number of credits that students could take online. That'll be going before the Board of Delegates next summer. It's still pretty skimpy. Um, the proposal that's going up still says nothing first year, and I think a total of 15 credits at one time. So you could take one off-campus semester. It's not only what the technology is, but there's also a big question about who's using it. 
and I'm just going to say this very briefly. I'd love to come back to this if anyone's interested. Um, we're, come on, baby. There we go. Ooh, that's a little fuzzy. Sorry. It doesn't surprise anybody that millennials are using technology different than Gen Xers or Gen Yers or baby booners or the silent generation. I mean, no, really? They use phones and they type better than we do? No, no surprise. What is interesting, and there's a number of studies that actually say they completely metabolize the information differently. And I'm going to just name two studies for you, and, and like I said, I'll come back. The fMRI brain studies have been particularly interesting because it actually you can actually see the synapses fire differently in a millennial's head than in an Xer's or a Y's head or a boomer's head. There's been one study that actually talks about how, or excuse me, how millennials literally sort information. And they sort information, I'm going to call it kind of globularly. They take bits of information from different places and pluck it all together. Whereas Xers and boomers, and I'm an Xer, I hate to admit it, but we think linearly. We put stuff in an order. We put stuff in a row. And you can actually watch the brains kind of process that. Similarly, and this one gets me a little bit more, literally there may be a, an opportunity to, to demonstrate that brains of millennials are processing the emotional responses, the biochemical responses of pleasure differently. The thing that gets me excited, the thing that makes me happy, might actually be a little different and shoot off different kinds of, of hormones in the brain. Um, and that may have to do with interacting with screens early enough and having incremental pleasure moments as opposed to larger pleasure moments, which may really impact the way that you design education. If you were used to getting like one big win at the end of the semester and that was awesome and so you all pumped yourself up for that and you had your final debate or your final exam and you were preparing for it, that's one kind of biochemical experience, not just emotional one. If millennials are used to getting a hit every time, a little, little teeny oxytocin hit every time they get you know, a message from a friend on MySpace or on um, or in any of these other, these other places, that's a slightly different biochemical experience of learning or engaging. So, and there's been a, a number of studies, but we'll, we'll go on. The other, the other piece that's interesting here that I think the NYUs of the world may be missing a little bit is this idea of what we now know about learning theory. There's been significant work on this, and, and I'll just highlight one piece that I think is particularly important for law schools. We have learned definitively that the best way to perfect a skill particularly a knowledge-imbued skill, a skill that takes some knowledge to get it done, is multiple attempts with low penalties for failure. You try it again, eh. you try it again, eh. didn't get it. Try it again, oh, I got that part. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next level. Try it again, didn't figure it out, ah, oh, figured it out, go to the next level. Does that sound like law school? How many folks and we still do this at my law school. How many folks take a 15-week class and then take one exam at the end? Write your name on blue books? Yeah, one chance, high penalty for failure. But we've really demonstrated that multiple attempts with low penalties of failure actually perfect skills that have knowledge pieces. And where do you think we've seen that figured out? Not your classic video game, right? Sit in your parents' basement and trying again and again and again. And what's really interesting is the folks who have really figured this out are the military. And the military has done significant work around training on all sorts of different kinds of training, um, using video games to really try to help folks before they go into the field and after they're in the field, figure out how to exercise skills in places where it's not just the first time you've ever been shot at, but you've, been, you've had multiple attempts to perfect, perfect skills before you get there. And just in case it, you think it's just about training to go forward or you question the biochemical experience of working in those situations, folks may have seen the story on MSNBC or um, NPR had a series of stories on this gentleman. They're starting to use games as ways to help people who are post-traumatic either control their post-traumatic stress disorder response or in this case to control pain. This guy is an incredible pain and he is completely unmedicated. He's playing a video game. And the fMRI brain studies actually show that when he is playing that video game in certain kinds of focused ways, it actually shuts down the pain centers in the brain and, and diverts that energy into a different part of his head. There is something that happens when we interact in these spaces, and it's different than what our traditional classrooms do. And it may help us perfect skills, or it may help us otherwise change the way we think. So if it's changing the way we think, what does that mean who we become? And although, you know, for the most part, I'm paid to do this stuff, I'm really curious about this stuff. Who are we as, as practitioners or as lawyers? And I think there's really two questions here. Are we, 
technicians? Are we computer programmers? Who are we in that respect? And who are we in relationship to our clients? Um, come on, baby. We're starting to see a whole world of law, of practiced law, that at least on the, on the interactive level doesn't involve lawyers. It's forms. It's online forms. It's smart forms. And a lot of people are getting their law at least their initial law through these portals. Good, bad, I mean, that is a wonderful conversation. Buy me a bottle of wine. We can talk about how awful it is. But this is really how many folks are, are writing their wills, are selling their property, are filing their divorces, are figuring out their child support, many of the basic kinds of things that happen in, in the world of legal services. This is also how a lot of smaller corporations are making their contracts. Here's the question for us as lawyers. Who does that? Do we write the forms? Does that mean that I need to learn programming? Or does an engineer write the form and the engineer hires me? Who hires who? Because I think it will fundamentally change what law looks like. If, if engineers are writing the forms and they just hire us to double check their work, those forms are going to look very different than if lawyers are sitting down and saying, OK, here's all the information that we want. And here are the places where you shouldn't be allowed to have a form. Here are the places that you actually should have to interact with a human being. There's another world, and I could not find a good image of algorithms shaking hands in space. So pretend this is a picture of algorithms shaking hands in space. Has anybody heard of contract bots? Yeah, you heard of contract bots? Essentially, we have two algorithms that go out and make a contract, and people never talk to each other. I've got wheat to sell. You need to buy wheat. So I tell the universe, I've got wheat to sell. It's organic. It's gorgeous. It's, um, it's going to cost roughly this much. Here's my price range. I can ship it within 100 miles and I let it go floating into the universe. You put an algorithm into the universe that says, I want to buy wheat, I want to buy it organic, and I want it within 100 miles of my home, and I'm willing to pay this much, and this is how, what I'll pay for transportation. And our two little algorithms go in the universe, and they shake hands. You have negotiation bots. Negotiation bots. They negotiate, they, they make an agreement. Wheat shows up on his doorstep. Cash shows up in my bank account. We've never met each other. We have no relationship. I might not even know where my wheat went. Again. What is a lawyer in that space? Are we writing the algorithms? Are we just litigating later because the engineers messed it up? What does is, what is law become? I also want to ask you a question, and, and I know David has done some of this work. It's a really interesting question who lawyers are becoming. There's at least two buckets to talk about. One is, who are lawyers when the client is no longer a simple client? And this is a lot of his work, I think. Now, it used to be that you had a public client. It was it was an agency, or you had a private client, it was a corporation, or you had an individual who was your client. Now we're finding that many lawyers are working across those, those spheres. Some folks um, at professional responsibility boards are saying you're not allowed to work for both folks. But he argues, at least, that we should work across those spheres, and we just should have different ethical obligations or responsibilities. I think if you add to that, who is the client? Is the client the technology, or is the client the end people who are using the technology? Can I have an agency relationship with someone who I will never meet, who's going to be filling out my form? Am I that person's agent? If I'm not that person's agent, then who, to whom do I have an ethical responsibility? That, frankly, this is one of those places we're going to have to rewrite the entire code of professional conduct, I think, because figuring out where your responsibility is is going to be very difficult. For those of us who teach philosophy of law, this is kind of sexy because you might get to go back to the lawyer statesman, which we've always wanted to go back to, the sense that you are just an officer of the court or an officer of the legal profession and you need to behave well. But what that means, I mean, who the heck knows? I think it's particularly interesting when you get into questions of due process. Canada has now automated a big section of its immigration reform, and this is the closest I can get to the form because um, I'm not going to fill out an immigration form for Canada. But you can literally be deported based on, or at least you can get a deportation status based on what your form spits out. And if you have a due process problem with that, you think that you haven't been judged fairly, who, to whom do you complain? Where is the due process violation? And how do you get an advocate for you? I mean, you have to have an advocate then at least who can argue with the code. Does that make sense? Is the form improperly designed? Is it an individual case? or is You get the idea. I mentioned earlier that I think these two places, the technology of practicing law and the technology of educating in law conflate. And, and this is where, for me, it does it. 
And honestly, I move this piece of the talk around depending on what audience I talk to because I can't figure out where it belongs because it, it is such this messy middle point. And it's not about law. Fold it. This is, this is well, let me start this way. Um, everybody know what a rhinovirus is? What's a rhinovirus? What's a rhinovirus? A chew. It's that little virus that gives you the common cold. It also can give you some nasty things. It's essentially, it looks like a little spaceship if you ever saw it in your biology book. It kind of has a pointy top and little legs, and it's this nasty little thing that carries around virus uh, DNA inside of it. And inside that little rhinovirus is an enzyme that turns on the RNA replication. It says, it is now time to make more virus stuff. And you make more DNA, and it floats out and makes more viruses, and it makes you sick. So this enzyme is kind of key. If this enzyme didn't turn on the rhinovirus, the virus could float around in your system forever and you wouldn't get sick. Scientists said, we gotta figure out what this, what this enzyme is. We can figure out the sequence of this enzyme. We can send drugs to target it to say, don't turn on. 10 years, 10 years of conferences, 10 years of NIH grants, 10 years of, you know, 10 year papers, nothing. No one could figure out the sequence of this virus. Until they took the problem to the game lab at the University of Washington. And they stuck it in a game called Fold It. Fold It, for all of us nerds, this is just Tetris on acid. You just get to play with moving things around. And it's a multiplayer game. It's like World of Warcraft. You know, you get everybody gets to phone in on your headsets in your parents' basement or in your garage, and you get to all play together and try to make the space, all these things fold together. And they started working on that enzyme basically told the, the folded audience, this is a gaming audience, I want to make that clear, this is a gaming audience, these are not biochem majors. It said, okay, figure out the GACT, get, get the sequence, tell us what it is, how long you might think it took them? Ten days. Ten days. Now here's the question, that I, and, and please, I, I would love help with this. What the hell just happened there? Is that a biochemistry class? Is that an NIH you know, uh, consultation group that figured out a piece of science? It's somewhere in that messy middle. They had to learn enough stuff to be able to do the problem. They weren't working in isolation like all the scientists who had been trying to figure it out before. They created new knowledge. And by the way, gang, I mean, we're lawyers, right? We are in the knowledge business. That's all we do. We don't make stuff. I, you know. I'm okay with a wrench, but for the most part, we're in the knowledge business. And if knowledge is be cre being created in these new places, who are these people? The traditional idea is that you come to school and you get told stuff by the experts, and you regurgitate it really well so the experts respect you, and they kind of let you in as an apprentice. And then you serve a few years in the guild until you're finally good enough to hang out with the rest of us, and then we'll, you know, and then you're a junior member of the guild, and then you're senior, these are gamers who did something the rest of the community couldn't do. It's not a legal ex uh, example, but I think for us it's really illustrative of where we may need to think about going as we think about who creates law, how we practice law, what law is. And that's really the question, right? What law is? And I, I really want to have time for a conversation, so I'm going to just touch on these two points really briefly. First of all, what does access to justice mean in this kind of new world? We looked at all of those form sites. A lot of lawyers are just mortified that folks may be filling out forms for their divorces or their contracts or their sale of real estate or their estates, except, you know what? You know, that's, that's what we need. There's no lack of demand for legal services. State of Washington just licensed, just a few months ago, actually licensed a new kind of legal professional. It used to be just JDs and then you had some secretaries, they've actually given a license to legal professionals to say, well, okay, you're working in this middle space, and there's certain things you can do. There's a school, um, and I'm gonna tell you, it's one of those for-profit schools that most nonprofit, good, you know, thinking law schools likes to revile, but they're really interesting. This little law school called South Florida Law School has three degrees that are not JDs. They're smack in this middle space. They have a master's in employment law, a master's in education law, and a master's in elder law. They have almost 100% placement with their graduates. They've got waiting lists up the wazoo. I mean, you can imagine, every, every nursing home in the country needs somebody with a master's in elder law. Most school districts need somebody with a master's in education law to deal with all the IEPs and everything else. There's this sudden need, 
And we really have a way to both educate those people and really give them some of the resources they need to be, to be effective. And by the way, they're unlicensed. At least Washington licensed these folks and has some control. I'm worried, frankly, I'm really worried that this space gets filled by somebody other than us. The legal profession has got to get in there and make sure that this space is well regulated. If we're only regulating this and this is where, the, this is where law is happening, not only will we we'll be irrelevant or at least underemployed, but I'm more worried that the kind of law that, that we think is important, what we're trying to do in our society as lawyers, as kind of the guardians of, of civil society, may, may get damaged. And then we really need to think more broadly about what law becomes. If law was thinking deeply, systematically, about cases, what happens when we become programmers? Do we stop thinking deeply? Do we start, or do we start thinking differently? Do we start systematizing things? It, do we become a service industry that just gives people what they want and some of the deep philosophical thinking goes away? Some folks who say, look, we need, just need legal services wouldn't, wouldn't mind if some of this deep thinking went away. They, you know, the Harvard people stopped thinking deeply and we just finally got people their divorces and their real estate for, for cheap prices. I'm worried. I don't want us to become a technical profession. Uh, that, that just services folks with what they want. I think we actually need to step up and own our profession and own our responsibility in that space. And I think it's a question that we need to address head on. <sighs> Why don't the largest US firms have R&D departments devoted, if not exactly to artificial intelligence, than to the development of other lesser challenges, such as the better automation, so that many of the routine processes that lawyers, senior and junior alike, must still contend with, must contend with still. Law firm R&D? Preposterous, you say. Law firms are in the business of practicing law, not carrying out blue sky activities like research and development. But isn't it really all a matter of return on investment? And should that R&D come up with cost-saving, quality-bettering process improvements? Well, who's to say the return won't warrant the investment? Should we at least be thinking about how technology is going to impact our practice of law and making sure that we do it, if not only efficiently, but let's think blue sky. Let's think about how law should change. What scares me about this is this is from Law Tech in 2004. We're lucky nobody's completely overrun us yet. We're lucky that the ABA has been kind of tight, that we're kind of conservative, that it took people a while to get around to challenging us, that LegalZoom is only a few years old. I, I'm kind of surprised that we're not in bigger trouble already, that some other profession hasn't come in and basically wiped us off, made us irrelevant, wiped us out of the way, so that the kinds of things that need to happen can. I think we, we got a problem. There's a little mind map. Um, I went a little longer than I wanted to, but I hope we can have a little time for questions. So, hit me. I, I, think, I think we're just lucky that, that they didn't do it earlier. Um, particularly in areas that, don't, that, that can't be protected by the licensing guild. We still have these little protections because folks have to be licensed in a certain way, but if you can get outside, and tax is a good example, where you don't have to have a licensed person doing the majority of that work. Um, London just, uh, excuse me, England just allowed a whole new ownership pattern, I see people nodding, around law firms, and I think you're going to see a lot of not only outside investment, but a lot of really interesting combinations over there. I know that there's been a couple already that have been chartered with um, engineers as primary owners of those law firms. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of that in Brazil as well. It's funny how the BRIC countries might get us. Um, I mean, I think that that's a real area where you're going to see that happen. So long as the ABA can, launch, can clamp down on some kinds of education and so long as the state guild, it, it, we still are requiring barred lawyers to do certain behaviors, I think the American market is protected, but I'm not sure how much longer that's going to last. Honestly, some states are, are loosening, some states are clamping down on their bar re requirements, some states are loosening up. Um, it's a very good question. I have two quick answers to that. One is I think the, the, the firms who are resistant are some of the firms that are really closing right now. And the, and the way they've been bracing against it, which is interesting, is, is some of those are the ones that blame the law schools for not teaching students well enough and are doing all lateral hires. And I wonder that they're, they might be buying them a little bit of short-term you know, space by having lateral hires. I mean, five years out now, there's a great market if you've got five years on you. 
but they're not training their people at all, which means their lateral hires are coming in with roughly the same skill set. Um, there is a, an interesting growth with even within those firms of what I'm going to kind of call legal technicians. Lots of folks, and, and right now the degree that folks are bringing into law firms is forensic computing. It's folks who can do a lot of the discovery work, a lot of that sort of thing. Um, knowledge management is more the IT side. I, I think those firms will, for a while, brace themselves, but I'm not sure that they'll actually survive. I think the firms that will be really interesting are the firms who kind of jump headlong in. I'm, I work with one firm and do some consulting, and they really went back and rewrote the entire way that they bill out. They essentially created everything they do as a form. They had big firm retreats where they went and figured out how to do a, a wind turbine siding. I work in environmental. And they, they, they just sunk you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars into them figuring out the most perfect way to do it, and they're going to treat that as a capital asset that they rent out to clients. It's a product, and and they treat it like it's a car, and so they're going to lease the car out to this client, that client, and they put some extra money in there to change the tire on the cars or update the forms once a year. So once things go to a value-based plan, I think that'll make. The, and that's exactly right. Um, that that may change it, and that incentivizes using this technology appropriately. When it's billable hours basis, there's almost no. There's a no incentive. Um, good question. I, I'll give you my personal bias. I think LegalZoom is fantastic. I think it is the best, one of the best things that's ever happened um, to give folks who weren't getting access to law um, some way to get the kinds of things that they couldn't get. And, and, for me, I think we're going to change the entire conversation about access to justice. I think the previous conversation of access to justice was highly paternalistic. We smart, wonderful lawyers are going to go help you poor people. I think there's two things that are happening here. One, we've, we've made it cheaper and more accessible, and that's great. The increases of distance learning generally in the legal world, particularly if we get into this middle degree, might mean that we actually also start educating people who are in that space. And I think that that is a Access to justice cannot be that the, those of us privileged help those of you who aren't. Access to justice really means that we educate the communities that actually need that, that, ac that access. And a combination of legal zoom plus you know, a degree that you can access because you're living in rural Georgia together actually creates a whole other kind of justice in, that, in the environment that doesn't occur when those of us from big firms fly down and help them out. Um, am I worried about JDs? Less so. My concern is not that it will ultimately be replaced, but it could get away from us for a little while and that we'll, we'll have to correct for it. And particularly, I think, with those, with those folks in the legal academy who are so resistant, it, I'll, I'll, here's my example, and it's from the legal academy, there are a number of for-profit law schools that are doing 100% of their legal teaching online. And in California, you can take the bar from a non-ABA accredited school. There was a year, a couple years ago, where one of the unaccredited California completely online programs had a higher bar passage rate than Pepperdine. And they had a four-year JD that you could have for a grand total of 40 grand. If the law schools in California are going to be so resistant to online teaching that other folks are going to swamp them, it's going to take a little while to, to sort that out. Similarly, in the transactional space, I'm not so worried that ultimately you know, humanity will prevail. I'm worried about you know, the weekend or two where it doesn't, where the technology gets ahead of the lawyers who were pretending it didn't exist or pretending it wouldn't ever really take over for our large law firms, and the, and the work we're going to have to do to sort it out, and frankly, the people who will get hurt in the meantime. I think LegalZoom actually did a really good job. I'm concerned if somebody less scrupulous in LegalZoom had been the first one to put up legal forms. Um, and, th and there's a famous story in Oregon about forms that went on back when it was still DOS systems, and some guy had said, well, I can automate all of your wills for you. It's great. It'll be cheap. I'll do $100. I'll do AB trusts for you. It'll be great. And he had set up all these AB trusts and then quit claimed every deed anybody had into the AB trust. And so, and my grandparents were among those folks who had to then go back and spend thousands of dollars reforming what had happened because, you know, somebody had put up a sloppy form. To be fair, I am chairing the working group. The working group has been fairly agnostic on delivery mechanisms. We have a working paper that's coming out. Um, if you're asking me in my personal capacity, yes. I have yes. strong opinions. Um, we are kind of the anti-Cassera. I should say Vermont Law School is a very 
quirky, funky little law school. We are an independent law school. We are not part of the university state university system, despite what my mother keeps thinking. Um, we're an independent little school, a law school with about 700 students, and we've got kind of one big thing we're known for. We have a, the number one ranked environmental program which is great because we have this thing to play with um, and, and yet a lot of autonomy and we're very nimble and it's a social justice school so I, I get to talk about that stuff. Um, in, in our experience, we launched, we have a LLM in environmental law and we have a master's degree, one of those middle space degrees in environmental um, law and policy and we launched both of those online a year ago, May. Our first graduates will be graduating at the end of this semester. 18 courses online, all taught, this is important, by our core faculty. We did not adjunct this stuff out. That model is highly interactive. It's completely asynchronous, which means you don't have to be online any time of day. You can be on at 2 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon. You sometimes have only 24 hours to turn something around, but it's highly interactive. And those classes are only 15 students. That, for me, is if you're trying to do deep mentoring and deep kind of engagement is key. These students, and I got to tell you, students who take both on campus and online classes say the online classes are harder by a long shot because you have to do something every day or within every couple of days and every student has to interact. And, and what we find is, is, you know, the Department of Ed did a study in, in a metadata analysis about three, four years ago now and they looked in, in higher ed, um, law schools weren't part of the study, but they actually looked in higher ed and found that on average, freaked everybody out, on average distance learning classes are marginally better than residential classes. It did not make the Department of Ed popular with most um, higher ed faculties. Um, but we're, I think in those models, I think that works. I worry about how sexy right now the Corsicas and, the, and, and so forth are because they are big video things and they're trying to build that interactive personal piece in and I'm not, from what I've seen, I'm not convinced that they've got it right yet. Ultimately, they might. Um, I think if you're trying to do skills-based, highly interpersonal stuff, it needs to be in a mentoring relationship. I gotta tell you, the money, you know, this idea, most schools, law schools included, I get couple calls a week from law schools that are panicked about that LSAT number say, wow, we're going to put a program online that's going to make us a million bucks. If you do it right, it's not a huge cash cow. It's, you know, I'm making money, but I'm not, you know, I'm not saving the law school. Um, it's really about a different form of education. The thing is, we are reaching people that could never, we're in South Royalton, Vermont. Have you ever heard of that town? I mean, it's, it's we have 3,000 people. We are the only law school in a town without a stoplight. People don't come to us. You know, th those folks who can come into that situation are probably like Harvard students. I mean, I went there, I'm a really privileged girl. You know, I could go to law school in my 20s in Vermont and ski. It was awesome. And that's not the experience of most folks that are actually doing the kind of, you know, really rugged environmental and social justice work. That's not who they are. They're older, which is one of my concerns, actually. I will say is, is it, our average student right now is in their early 40s in the distance learning program. They're on second careers, most of them. Yeah. I do worry that we have designed a lot of what we do in distance learning for the Xers and the boomers. And when the millennials come up, we're going to have to look at redesign um, because it's a really good thing for an Xer. Xers love my program. I'm not sure the millennials will like it as much. And we're going to have to look at how that works. But I think there is a lot going on in that space, and, and at least when I talk to law schools, most law professors are just mortified that I'm even talking about distance learning, that that's just, you know, that's, that's a violence to the grand tradition. And I want to say, well, Langdell was the grand tradition, and he was a violence to what came before him. I mean, I, I, do I think it's better than classroom teaching? I don't know. I don't care. It's just here. They're, they're doing it, they're doing it lar largely like my model, with right. like the asynchronous model. They, um, they got in it earlier. Northumberland. They do a lot of simulations. And you know the other people who's just spanking us on this stuff is the Australians. Yes. They figured out a long time ago that they couldn't get everybody down to the population centers. And so they've had online legal programs. And, and Australia has been ranked one of the highest um, countries in the world for access to legal services. Funny. So anyway. Well, hopefully this is proof that we can have learning and cross-ferment on these important conversations here at Harvard Law School. Um, so thank you very oh, much. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Thank you.